So thank you all. Uh, mahalo. Thank you for having us here tonight. Can everyone hear me back there? Okay. I've been told that I have a big mouth, so I thought you should be able to hear me. Um, Matt and I have known Lee and Ken for a long time. We've been in the freedom movement for more years than I'm going to ad admit to. Um, we've been married for 35 years. Uh, six years ago now, we started an organization called Free the People. It's a nonprofit organization that uses video storytelling to reach young people or the liberty curious, as we like to say, <laughs> with the ideas of, of liberty and freedom and, and the beautiful things that happen when individuals are left alone to live their own lives. Um, do you want to say anything or should I keep going? So kind of um, on a roll. She, she's going to do fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to tell a story randomly. Uh, Terry and I were scheduled to speak in Milan in 2019 uh, before the world ended and we had started speaking together and I think Terry will talk a little bit about that but for business reasons Terry had to cancel at the last minute so I had to go to Milan to do the Matt and Terry show without Terry <laughs> and afterwards a young lady who had seen us speak before came up to me and said it's a lot better when Terry's with you. <laughs> so you guys are lucky. Like if you were there last night, that was cool. But um, I'm told from experts that it's better when, when Terry speaks more than I do. <laughs> what she usually does, Which by the I, way. So as I said, we use storytelling to reach people. And so you all got invited here tonight for, to hear us talk about Whiskey is Freedom. And we're going to tell a lot of stories about whiskey. Um, why we drink it, really cool stories about the history of, of whiskey. Um, we do this to actually teach people. You're actually going to be sitting through an hour and a half lecture on tax policy and regulatory policy, um, <laughs> hidden in beautiful stories about whiskey and, and why whiskey and bourbon has become what it is. We've also discovered that people think we're much better after we start serving you all whiskey. <laughs> so, so we got to figure out, like, this will be spontaneous and and it'll get interesting after a couple whiskeys, but um, <laughs> we're going to figure out a way to pass around samples of these things that we're going to talk about. But it's also important to remember that the thing that annoys my wife most about me, I should think about that before I say it, <laughs> is I love to quote dead people, specifically dead libertarian economists. So part of my challenge tonight is to weave in as many Austrian economists <laughs> as my wife will bear and um, every time i quote one you guys got a drink <laughs> those are the rules so we're gonna start i don't know if somebody back there we're gonna start t um drinking and talking about bourbon and there's a matt do you want to i'll just, just go. get it started so we have brought four of our favorite ah, thank you yeah, that'd be it's great. So, so the first one is this one. So we have brought four of our favorite um, bourbons and whiskeys to, to drink tonight, to taste. Uh, we have an Angel's Envy, which is um, a bourbon, my favorite. It was my gateway bourbon, and I will tell that story. Then we're going to go on to a Whistle Pig Rye. Um, he's a big rye drinker. And then we're going to shift and go to Ireland and drink some red breast and then go to Scotland. Um, How many people drink whiskey? You're in the right place. <laughs> so we're passing around trays. There's just a little taste in each of, you know, for everyone to try it. You don't have to drink it if you don't want, because then there's just more for us to drink after we're done talking. Um, yeah, and if you want to, if you want to share, that's cool, too. Um, we started doing this at Free the People. Terry mentioned we love to tell stories. And our, our theory was that most people, much to my chagrin, don't think about downward sloping demand curves. They don't think about the non-aggression principle. Um, they don't like facts and figures and, and data. They love a good story. And they particularly love a good story about something that they actually care about. So we originally started telling stories about beer. I stopped at one of your local craft brewers before I got here because the only thing to wash down a good whiskey with is a good beer. <laughs> But it was, a, it, was a, it was a way for us to get people originally to appreciate what happens when you embrace socialism. Because you'll remember a couple years ago, five years ago maybe now, uh, Venezuela ran out of beer. 
Think about going through the hell of Venezuela today <laughs> without a cold beer. This was the highest uh, uh, per capita consuming beer culture in all of Latin America, and they ran out of beer. So we, we started doing videos about beer, but they were really videos about economics and what happens when you destroy your currency, what happens when you nationalize the farms, what happens when no one else wants to trade with you anymore because you steal their stuff. And, and it was also a very cool way to make my drinking habit a tax write-off. So that was cool. <laughs> so one of the um, cool projects that we've done um, is that we connected a brewer in Belgrade, Serbia named Vladimir and his brewery is called Dogma. And it's a, it's a brand new uh, brewery. We were there when they were still like welding the tables together on a Sunday afternoon. Um, and we connected him with a good friend of ours named Jim Caruso. And Jim Caruso owns Flying Dog Brewing Company. And Flying Dog, oh, now I'm gonna really start talking. Um, <laughs> Flying Dog, it started out as a small craft brewery. It's now the 32nd largest brewery in, in the country. Um, Jim is a good friend of ours. He's a, a strong libertarian and he makes really good beer. And Vladimir um, has this really cool project where he likes to collaborate with people in different countries to make cool beer. And I'm going to bastardize the Bastiat quote. I'm stealing one from him. Um, but Bastiat, by the way, is a dead economist. So, so, so cheers. <laughs> <laughs> So Bastiat said, when goods cross borders, troops don't. And so we changed that to say, when hops cross borders, troops don't. So we connected Vladimir with our friend Jim, and they, they made a beautiful beer. Jim flew his head brewer over to um, sorry, Belgrade. Sorry, I had a mind moment there. Yeah, you, you should drink. Okay. Yeah. Every time you make a mistake, you drink. <laughs> Uh, this is Angel's Envy. Yeah, we'll get to this. All right, we'll get there. I guess we're going to talk about... So, so I started drinking Angel's Envy. <laughs> this is Angel's Envy, right. by the way. And just to describe it, um, this we would call this a gateway whiskey. It is, it is lighter in alcohol. I think it's 43.3%. .3 and it is super smooth, right? And so if, if you drink other whiskeys, you'll notice that this, it's a little dangerous, right? You can throw this bad boy back. And, and we first, or Terry first discovered this whiskey. On when, Valentine's Day. On Valentine's Day, <laughs> when I still worked at an organization called Freedom Works. And the forces of evil, particularly a um, reporter from Mother Jones, which is a communist magazine, <laughs> called me up while I was getting on the plane. And I'm not gonna get into the details, but my response, I, this is a mostly adult audience, my response, because I was caught off guard, was, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Which showed up in Mother Jones, sorry. <laughs> so so we, this happened, he were, we were flying down to Charleston, South Carolina. He was giving a talk the next day, and we had made dinner plans at our favorite restaurant. Well, we hadn't actually made plans because we didn't have reservations, because we never think ahead. Um, so we ended up sitting at the bar for dinner, which is great. We love to do that. We get to talk to a lot of people. Well, he kept fielding phone calls from angry reporters and then <laughs> pissed off boards of, board of directors. And it was just, it was not the best Valentine's Day we've ever spent. And he kept leaving to go talk, you know, take these phone calls. And the, <laughs> the bartender, she said to me, so do you drink bourbon? <laughs> and I said, no. And she goes, I think you should. <laughs> and I said, you know, I've tried it. I've never really liked it. And so she gave me Angel's Envy. So Angel's Envy was truly my, my gateway bourbon. Now, what's, what's interesting about bourbon, and, and bourbon, as, as you guys probably know, comes from Kentucky. And the difference between bourbon and other whiskeys is that it is primarily made from corn. And, and one of the themes you'll hear tonight, if we, if we actually stay on script, which isn't guaranteed at all, <laughs> is that one of, one of the stories of whiskey is, is localism and, and almost a, a, a local pride in what's available to you. And as it turns out, um, Kentucky was kind of a late comer to the whiskey revolution, but it turned out that the necessity of making whiskey from corn turned into this beautiful thing because bourbon is much sweeter than, than rye, it's much sweeter than uh, virtually any other whiskey, 
What's interesting about this, and one of the reasons it's so smooth, is this was the first bourbon to be finished in port wine casks. And it's a tradition that is, is uh, more typical in Scotland. And, and bourbon was never treated that way, but, but you can taste a little bit of the port. It takes a little bit of the edge off. And it's one of these sort of um, stories about entrepreneurship and innovation where people keep stealing other people's ideas. And sometimes it's accidental, but it's usually always beautiful. What do you guys think of this bourbon? So can I correct you for the first time this evening? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said that bourbon is from Kentucky. Um, and most people think that bourbon has to be made in Kentucky, but that's not true. <laughs> to be designated bourbon, it has to simply be 51% corn in the, in the mash bill. But, so bourbon can come from anywhere in, in the country. Um, just as a clarification. Including and Costco, right? Including yeah. Costco, <laughs> yeah. Costco yeah. yeah. and Sam's Club both have this. They it. have this, yeah. yeah. And um, so we're going to get to, we'll talk about the rye next, and then that's actually when the economics of um, some of this will come into play. But Angel's Envy, how many of you know the phrase Angel Share? Has anyone heard that Angel phrase? Angel, Angel Share. 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 Um, so when, you know, bourbon gets aged, it's aged in wooden casks, and things evaporate, right? I mean, they're not solid. And so what gets evaporated out is oh, yeah, called the angel right. share. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. this is called angel's envy because it's what's left in the barrels and the angels don't get to drink it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, um, let's start distributing the second whiskey um, because this, this is when the story gets sort of interesting. So, so I'm from, I grew up in Pittsburgh. I'm a proud, um, Pittsburgher, go Steelers. Oh, good. Which um, one? What? Which one? Oh, the the rye. Uh, whistle pig rye. Whistle pig is rye. the next one. Yeah. So Pittsburgh had um, was the start of the whiskey rebellion, and I love this story. Um, well, do you talk about the economics of mo the monetary policy behind? behind whiskey. And then so what, one, of the, one of the themes we're going to touch on tonight is that whiskey, no matter how far back you go in history, and you can go quite a ways back, um, it's this beautiful thing that emerges spontaneously. And, and one of the reasons why people started making whiskey, and very practical reasons, is like, what do you do with this grain that you've produced? It's not going to keep over the winter. The rats are going to get into it. It's going to mold. Um, they had all sorts of problems with storage. So one way to turn um, the entire value of your, of your family's wealth into something that would last the winter would be to turn it into beer and ultimately whiskey. And by the way, whiskey is just distilled beer. It's the same thing. And um, this is where we drink to our first dead economist, Carl Menger. Anybody know Carl Menger? Yes. This, you, you guys are my people. <laughs> Carl Menger was the founder of the Austrian School of Economics and, and one of the most important books he wrote was about the evolution of money. And if you know anything about, uh, about Ron Paul when he quotes Ludwig von Mises, that's another dead economist right there. <laughs> um, Ron Paul loves gold because the Austrians liked commodities as currency because commodities that were deemed valuable by people were harder for governments to manipulate, right? That's, that's, why, that's why gold was a thing. Um, that's why crypto is a thing. Shout out to Matthew. Um, but even before that, whiskey was a store of value. Whiskey was the means by which um, people in, in agrarian areas could trade value for value. So naturally, that's the first thing that government targeted, right? Yes. So, um, yes. Yeah. 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 So the- George Washington is a bad man. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the whiskey tax, well, it was actually a distilled spirits tax, was the first federal tax ever levied in, in the country. It was in 1791. And it was really a, a federal, it was a Wall Street bailout. What had happened was the states had all of their debts from the, from the war, from the Revolutionary War, that had been rolled up into the federal debts. 
So they had to figure out how to pay these. So Hamilton, not a good guy, <laughs> decided to tax distilled spirits. Um, and at the time, it was actually mo more rye whiskey than, than corn whiskey. So rye whiskey um, started in, in the United States first. But the, the major distillers, the larger guys, were on the East Coast. They were in Philadelphia, where the capital was. Um, you know, Washington, the, I heard this from a bartender, and I think that everything that I ever hear from a bartender is true. That's where I get all of my knowledge. Um, <laughs> and this was actually during a distillery tour, but he said that the distilled spirits tax exempted hard cider. So George Washington was the president when the distilled spirits tax was implemented, and he was also the largest hard cider producer. <laughs> so it sounds plausible to me that yeah. this happened. I, I believe everything my bartender tells me. <laughs> and and we've, we've gone back and sort of Googled things, and it turns out that bartenders are much smarter than politicians, for instance. <laughs> so, so it's 1791, they implement the distilled spirits tax, and it was designed, you could pay for it either a flat tax or per capita, per barrel of whiskey or whatever you're making. Um, so the larger distillers on the East Coast, see, it all comes back to cronyism. They were able to afford to pay the, the, the flat rate, whatever that was, which gave them a much lower tax rate than the mom and pop distillers, you know, on the Western um, border of the country, which is Pittsburgh. So the, the distillers in Pittsburgh and, and places over there were paying twice as much, and they said, there is no way we're doing this. They were supposed to register their stills, and if they didn't register them, they had to go all the way across Pennsylvania to Philadelphia to like pay their fines. And they were like, there's no way. So, so to put it, like, think about this in the modern context of some of the arguments we have every day about insiders and outsiders and and those of us that have a seat at the table versus those of us that pay the price for that. Um, Alexander Hamilton, I don't care if you like the musical, <laughs> he was a bad guy. And we're about to tell you a story about where America went wrong. And, and America was, what, one or two years old at this point? And um, you remember Thomas Jefferson refused to go to the, Continental Con the, the Constitutional Convention because it was a huge wealth transfer from the rest of the colonies to the New York interests. And that's who Alexander Hamilton is, is representing here. Um, they inherited all these debts, as Terry said, and the only way to erase those debts when we signed the Constitution, wait for it, a national bank, <laughs> the Fed, right? So how did he fund the creation of a national bank? He taxed whiskey in Pennsylvania. They did not think that was cool. No. So it was, what's his first name? Wiggle. Uh, Robert? Sure. Anyway, Robert Wiggle. <laughs> We're going to call him Robert. We'll call him Bob. Well, Bob Wiggle. <laughs> Wiggle was his last name for sure. I just don't remember his, his first name. He was the first distiller that said no. When the tax man showed up knocking at his door, he was not greeted with smiles and here, take my money. He was told to get lost, basically. And it was that man that started the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, it got ugly. I mean, they were tar and feathering the, the tax man. Um, Washington sent in- We're not advocating no, that, don't, no. don't do that. <laughs> but Washington sent in 13,000 troops. I, you. Yeah, yeah. Imagine that 13,000 US troops were sent to Pittsburgh to quell the Whiskey Rebellion. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Very good. So, Very good. So the segue here is um, in Kentucky, and bourbon wasn't a thing yet because... Well, Kentucky wasn't a thing yet. Kentucky. <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. Um, but um, whiskey at that time was not made from corn. It was made from rye. Mm -hmm. And what you have in your glass... Um, is not a Monongahela rye from Pittsburgh because we bought these whiskeys in Oklahoma City and they didn't have it at all. <laughs> um, but this is one of my favorite rye whiskeys. Uh, Whistle Pig, 10 years old. Uh, Whistle Pig is a Vermont distiller. You've probably seen this on the shelves and bars. 
Um, it, it, it is also true that this is not Vermont distilled rye. This is sourced from Indiana. And, but there are other whistle pigs where you can get where they've actually um, produced uh, with Vermont rye. But if, if you taste this, it's so much different than the last one, right? Yeah. It's, spicy. It's, it's spicy. Yeah. And uh, it's, I prefer rye to bourbon. Terry prefers bourbon to rye. So it's, it's, it's one of the stress points in our marriage. No, I was, no, I was, so, so you think it's a stress point. I was gonna say it's actually a, a benefit because it means that he's not gonna drink my angel's envy when I'm not looking. <laughs> Unless it's the angel's envy rye. My angel's envy got disappeared. <laughs> it happens. It happens. It evaporates. Okay, so who likes um, who likes uh, the bourbon better? So that's Team the first Terry. One. <laughs> Who's on Team Matt? Who's with the rye? All right. It's Sorry, kind of dude. 50-50. I, I think she won. That. <laughs> not the first time not the first time <laughs> okay let's let's move on to the next one okay it does kind of look like a maple syrup jar so so one of the things that um terry and i do for fun is when we travel we love to drink whatever the locals are making and sometimes that's beer sometimes that's whiskey um, and when you're in kentucky it's, it's, it's bourbon. Yeah, it's a little blurry. I think I've been to Kentucky. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're, we're that sort of traveler. Like we're into cuisine. We're into what the locals are drinking. Um, and, you know, when you get into Europe and other places, it gets pretty interesting. But one of our favorite places is the country of Georgia. All right. So oh, we're veering off to wine. Just okay. it's it's a it's an but we're st one. I'm just waiting till Lee gets. Oh, OK. Gets her thing not going. The red oh, the red breast. Red breast. But we didn't, you didn't mention any dead economists or anything lately. You're moving along quickly to the third one already? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> it gets blurry. <laughs> David Ricardo, a dead economist, Do talked a lot. What? That's all that he knows. Do they have to be Austrian? I thought so. David Ricardo is not an Austrian, but okay. but he, he would be a, a, a classical economist. I think, I think he's okay, he's okay. on some things. Yes, on some things. Um, but he talked about comparative advantage yeah. and, and one of the, <laughs> one of the reasons why it's so fun, like watch how I bring this back. <laughs> one of the reasons it's so fun to drink local is that every community and, and every geography and every economy is better at doing something that no one else can do. Right? So the comparative advantage for Pittsburgh for a lot of reasons was let's make rye because that's what we got. And, and you know, the accidental discovery of aging whiskey in barrels was just the necessity of, of shipping it and storing it from one place to another. And when they got it back out of the barrel, they're like, wow, this is different. The tannins from the wood have made this. Um, and, and back then, by the way, it was white lightning. It, it would have been clear and it would have burned like hell. Yeah. Yeah, and, the, the color of the bourbon comes from the charred barrels. Yeah, and one of the things that makes whiskey so interesting is the charring of the barrels. But um, I quoted David Ricardo, so you guys got a drink. So he, he mentioned Georgia, and we're going to veer off just quickly to, and talk about wine in the, con the country of Georgia, not the state of Georgia. Wine from the state of Georgia is not very good. <laughs> wine from the country of Georgia is is beautiful. Yes. Um, Georgian wine is actually um, the it's the first region that produced wine. The French think that they did it, but they lie. It was actually in Georgia. Yes. And they they have this beautiful way of of aging it. Can you hand me my Irish, please? That's oh. the rye. I want the you, Irish. You're just skipping the rye, aren't you? Uh huh. <laughs> so the Georgians, when they age their wines in the traditional method, they do it in a, a giant um, clay pot called a quervi that actually gets buried in the ground. And, and their wines are, are beautiful. And we've, we've been there a couple different times. We've done wine tastings. And the, it was actually the communists that, that ruined Georgian wine for a long time. 
because the was it it was Stalin. Joseph Stalin. Who was from Georgia? You'll be shocked to know Joseph Stalin, mass murderer, one of the baddest men in the history of the universe. Um, it's probably not as bad, but he likes sweet shitty wine. <laughs> And, and so, so he, he destroyed it in 8,000 year tradition and replaced it with, with shitty sweet plonk. And for that, we damn him. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, it's really great though, the country, it, it's one of our favorite places to visit. And you go and you meet, you know, one of the reasons that we, I enjoy, you know, going and, and drinking locally is that you meet the people, you meet the entrepreneurs and the, the artists really that, that create these things and in Georgia we met people that were able to actually go back and buy the land that had been stolen from them by Stalin and others and and bring back their history of their family making wine so it's really really and we great. hope uh, the reason I bring that up is we hope to actually create a documentary about Georgian wine and and the beauty of it the history of it the the magnificent cultural significance of wine. They, they drink wine at every meal. It's part of their culture. How Stalin almost destroyed it, but freedom brought it back. And, and if you like wine, you're gonna watch the documentary, but there's a story in there that's, that's far more substantial. And Matt Lee and I are actually going to be in Tbilisi, Georgia at uh, April, April 30th, uh, speaking at a, on the Free Market Roadshow. So that's... Are you going to have a tomato? <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> I do have a complaint about the no-fly zone. There are, there are three flies in my red breast Irish whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just add some protein. And, and they, are, they are drunk now. <laughs> and, and that was such a smooth pivot back to whiskey. So um, I'm half Irish, half German. Um, and so I had always wanted to go to Ireland and we went there for our 20th wedding anniversary? Tw 20th, that was a long time ago. Yeah, sorry. Um, so we went <laughs> and as he said, we like to drink local and we go and, and it's really, we go to learn a lot and, and we do. And so we wanted to figure out Irish whiskey. So we of course start Googling the best Irish whiskey bar in Ireland and it's a place called Dick Max in Dingle, Ireland, which is in the middle of nowhere. It's a, it's a beautiful little town. It's actually on the Gulf Stream, so it's it's a much warmer climate. And this this pub was just fantastic. We met a Trump supporter there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was kind of funny. Um, so we're sitting there and we're we're talking to the the bartender and we just started immersing ourselves in the history of Irish whiskey and how it became what it is and why it is so different from scotch. And you'll be shocked to know that it has to do with taxes. Mm. Yeah. See, I told you it was gonna be, you know, a tax policy talk. <laughs> <laughs> the, so one, one, of the, um, one of the themes tonight, hopefully, is that government is no damn good, right? <laughs> And, and for the entire history of whiskey, the government has tried to tax it and regulate it and control it and seize it and destroy it and all the things that governments do so well. Um, the history of the British malt tax turns out to be completely important in the creation of Irish whiskey. Because have you guys had Scotch whiskey before? So you'll notice, and you've had Irish whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, Irish whiskey, um, in my mind, tastes like butter. Like it is so smooth and it doesn't have any of the bite right. that you would get from any scotch, peated or not. Yeah, so after we spent the time in, um, in Dingle, we were driving back to Dublin and we stopped at Middleton Distillery, which makes Red Breast. And we, of course, started having a very deep political and policy discussion with the bartender at the distillery. And what he told us, which we then actually went back and, and read more about, is that when the, the Brits imposed a malt tax, the Irish figured out a way to make beautiful whiskey while minimizing the amount of malt that they needed to do because they didn't want to pay taxes. The Scots, on the other hand, 
lifted up their kilts to the government, said <laughs> F you, and doubled down on the amount of malt that they put in their whiskey. So what's funny about this, and perhaps relevant to today, is that the whiskey tax and the malt tax and all of the taxes on everything that it took to produce a good whis whiskey in the entire United Kingdom, um, why did they need so many taxes? Anyone guess? War. 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 They, they were endlessly trying to take over the world. They were doing nation building before it was a thing. And the, the Irish decided instead of fighting, because they have beautiful voices, they sing at pubs, they're not fighters, they're lovers. Um, we're, we're just gonna use unmalted barley and make a different whiskey. So they dodged the tax, they innovated around it. And, and one of the beautiful things about the story of, of any alcohol, we were talking about Georgia earlier and the way that innovation and the human spirit defeated the most tyrannical dictator in history the Irish just said, okay, we're gonna make it a different way. We're not gonna malt the barley. And, and malted barley is the toasting of the barley so that it sprouts and it, it creates a different flavor in the whiskey. Um, Irish whiskey is primarily unmalted barley and that creates a very different flavor profile. Um, if you've drank in an Irish bar and you drink lots of Irish whiskey, you know that it goes down really well. <laughs> So, you know, back in the day, just like in, in Pennsylvania, taxes needed to be collected in person, right? Like you couldn't do it online. You couldn't send in a check. The tax collector, I mean, you weren't going to go to him to, you know, voluntarily pay your taxes. So the tax collectors had to come to you. So in Scotland, and we learned, well, actually I read this about, I didn't learn this from a bartender. Go so it figure. might not be true. She it's read it on not. Wikipedia. <laughs> right. So what happened was, you know, Edinburgh was the center of Scotland and the tax collectors started out there. And I'm, I, there's a, I think there's a few government workers in here and I might insult you with this next comment, but government workers tend to not really want to work that hard. Present right? company accepted. Present company accepted, of course. So the tax collectors in Edinburgh that had to go out and collect the, the malt tax, they went to the, the, the distillers that were close to Edinburgh. In the, in the lowlands of Scotland, because it was too hard to travel to the highlands. So they ba basically left the highland distillers alone, which left the distillers there with more capital and more money so that they were able to innovate and make a better whiskey. So to this day, highland whiskey is considered much better than lowland whiskey because they were left alone by the government so that they could innovate and produce a better product. <laughs> Does everybody have red breast that wants red breast? Oh, now she is. This is the Ardberg now. Well, where does the Isle of Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, is this is this the Ardberg? Yeah, that's the Ardberg. Yeah. So um, it's it's interesting that you brought up Isle because Isle is considered a completely separate area from the highlands and that's where we no we went to the isle of sky we haven't been to isla yet i should yeah. be holding these up so so do you, you guys have the art bag in your hands is that correct you okay you can if you smell you'll it know. you'll know <laughs> you'll know and i i sort of i sort of i sort of added this to the mix just to piss off my wife <laughs> Because as much as she's not a fan of rye, um, this super peaty, smoky, how would you describe this whiskey? It smells like a Band-Aid to me. <laughs> but that's, that's actually, I mean, that's That's used. a compliment if you like this whiskey. Right, right. Um, and I used to drink these heavy peated whiskeys. His dad was a Laphroaig guy. Yeah, Laphroaig. And I would, back in the day, I would drink Laphroaig with his dad. And you didn't like it back then. You would drink a beer. Yeah. I think that's why your dad liked me more than you. <laughs> Everybody likes you more than me. That's how it is. Um, this, uh, this particular whiskey um, this did all, uh, by, by the way, all of these are beautiful whiskeys. 
Um, they're the best of their style, in our opinion. Um, we discovered this during lockdowns in Washington, D.C. And we've been talking a lot about lockdowns. I ha as an aside... So there's a plus to lockdowns. Then. Yeah, well, there, yeah. Is a, there is a plus to lockdowns. But as an aside, I have to note that Terry and I landed five or six days ago. And when we took off, it was my understanding that I would have to show my papers in order to buy a hamburger. And by the way, shout out to you guys, because did, did Lee ask you for your papers to, to join us tonight? Yeah. As of today, I know, right. And I, well, as of today. And I, and I had written a speech for the Grassroot Institute, which was a scathing indictment of the idea that you would discriminate against people. You would ban them from restaurants simply based on their health status. Like how retrograde is that, that we've gotten to that point? Um, and perhaps by accident, by the time I had landed, and perhaps rumors got out that I was gonna give that speech, <laughs> the governor backed down. <laughs> so I'm not taking all the credit, I suspect that grassroots, I suspect that grassroots had something to do with it. And by the way, in all honesty, I believe that truckers in Canada had a lot to do with that. <laughs> Here's the Canadian truckers. Um, what's my point here? I don't know. I, I don't know. Can I tell the Eric story? Yeah. So um, speaking of lockdowns and, and government overreach, uh, we've become friends. This isn't an actual whiskey story, but it's about a bar. So I think it, it works with the theme of tonight. Right. So on January 15th in Washington, DC, uh, the mayor announced that you had to show your papers to go into any restaurant, gym, or movie theater. And it's Washington, D.C., and everyone complied, <laughs> except for our now good friend, a guy named Eric Flannery. Eric owns a, he's a, um, he's a vet. He actually was a submarine vet. He spent some time here um, in Hawaii. He says aloha. And um, he said no. And he famously tweeted out on January 5th, 14th, everyone is welcome as it was before and as it is tomorrow, I hope to see you all here. And he basically said that I will not discriminate against you because of your health status. Cheers to Eric on that. Cheers to Eric. Cheers. Right. He also had tweeted that DC had mask mandates as well, um, but it's the same bullshit as it is everywhere, right? Like you put your mask on, you walk into a restaurant, you sit down at the table, you take your mask off, you sit down at the bar, you take your mask off, and all of the, the, the wait staff have to wear their masks. And he said, my team members are not second class citizens. If they want to wear a mask, they can. If they don't want to, that's fine. So these, that became public and his refusal to check people's papers. And DC, and probably the only time that I've ever seen them act efficiently and quickly, <laughs> put the wrath of the bureaucrats on Eric. They gave him multiple thousand dollar fines because of the, the mask mandate. They took his liquor license away from him because he refused to check health status. The health department came in and wrote up stupid reasons and he lost his business license. Oh my God. So we, um, and we were there the last night, we had been traveling um, when this was all going on, but we were back in DC the last night that he was open. He, he didn't have a liquor license at that point, but he was still allowed to sell food. And the place was, was packed. And we got to know Eric. Um, it, was, it was great. Rand Paul was there. Shout out to Rand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thomas Massey was there. And, and there was this great gathering of people that were just so against all of these lockdowns. And we have a good friend of ours, a guy named Robert Alt, who runs the Buckeye Institute. It's the equivalent of Grassroot Institute in Ohio but he also has a, a legal center. And Eric was trying to find a lawyer that would help him go against, to stand up to the alcohol control board and say, you know, I want my license back. And not surprisingly, there was not a lawyer in DC that was willing to go up against the bureaucracy. Boo, lawyers, sorry, <laughs> boo. Hey, let me just say for the record, he had he called me, I would have not only, the only question for me, would it have been free or would I have made him put some skin in the game? Right. 
So yeah. not boo to lawyers. Right. I know. Boo to, boo, boo to those boo to the lawyers. lawyers who don't stand up. For boo the to right the machine. Shit. The machine. Right. Yeah. So boo, to boo to everybody well, who doesn't stand up right. for the right stuff. So we reached out to Robert Ald, and yeah. Robert is a hero because he was the guy. The Buckeye Institute was the institution behind the case that went to the Supreme Court that fought the OSHA mandate that required um, employees to, ha you know what, companies over 100, yeah. I don't know, yeah. stupid rule. It was bad. It was bad. Anyway, Robert is the lawyer that took that all the way up to the Supreme Court that got the OSHA ruling overturned. Great. So Robert said, oh yeah, I'm in. <laughs> and he's doing it pro bono. The Buckeye Institute. Yeah, for lawyers. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Well, I, I mean, the, the Buckeye Institute is like us. Um, it's it's a nonprofit foundation. I mean, they they like the Grassroot Institute, like us. Um, they, you know, we rely on on donations from people. And so Robert is doing this just as part of his overall programs, and he's gotten the business license has been reinstalled. He still doesn't have the his liquor license back. But I was just talking to Robert yesterday, and he said, DC is taking this really seriously. They have a lot of lawyers on yeah. this case. But when he, um, when he had his very first hearing with the Liquor Control Board, it was over Zoom. The, he had local counsel that turned out to be terrible. And, and they were like, why do you need a lawyer? Like, you don't need representation. Like nobody watches these things. Like this is gonna be, it's fine. And then during this online thing, she's like, the Washington Post is watching this. I mean, it's it's a big thing. And it and the case really comes down to the unconstitutional aspects of government agencies shutting down businesses and imposing all of these mandates and, and regulations against us. So if you want to meet Eric and Robert, you can watch them. I had them on my show, Kibbe on Liberty, a couple weeks ago. Um, you can also see a short film that our team made about Eric, just defending this idea that you wouldn't discriminate against people, which used to be, I, I thought we were there. <laughs> we're not there anymore, so we're back again. but. We've teamed up with this legal team. We're not lawyers, we're storytellers, but one of the things that we think we can accomplish is to make sure by telling the story and fighting the legal case that this never happens again. So that's that's our goal with that. But Lee has reminded me that I went off on a on a rail about Ardbeg. <laughs> like how did we get here? <laughs> Well, you, you talked about lockdowns. Yeah, so so um, lockdowns lockdowns weren't all bad for us because we didn't lock down generally. And it's 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 actually pretty cool driving halfway across the country when no one's on the road. You can drive really fast, as it turns out. But uh, one of the things that we did, um, we, we didn't know this particular whiskey. We know Islay whiskeys, which are the most peaty, uh, generally, of the Scottish whiskeys. Um, but our local liquor store had an Ardbeg tasting in their parking lot. Ah. And it was a beautiful day. We bought way too much whiskey and we fell in love with this particular one, which um, I didn't warn you. This is cast strength. The angels took a lot of this whiskey out of the barrel. <laughs> so it is, I can't read that. I think it's like 56% alcohol. Wow. And um, what makes this a more drinkable um, peaty whiskey is that they finished it in sherry barrels, which takes a little bit of the edge off. So you get the smoke, um, and Terry still gets the Band-Aid because she has a, <laughs> uh, an unfair bias against peated whiskeys. Really? But to me, it's a very drinkable, high alcohol, highly peated whiskey. Is that the 10 year one or a five? Or the five? No, this, this is... Um, more? 16? No, it's like 10. 10. Yeah. That's one of them. So here's a, here's a different question. Audience participation, and I won't judge you if you don't vote with me. Um, red breast? <laughs> or red breast. Red breast. Who's, who's, who's with red breast? Who's down with red breast? Okay. Who's down with Ardbeg? Oh, Do you want to declare a victory? <laughs> I'll call this one a tie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But who's counting? But who's counting? It's all about the peat. Yeah. 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 And I do actually like this one. 
Um, you either like it or you don't, and that's but, that's the point. Like all of these are so different, and it is so cool to discover the history of these things and and why that tastes like that and why this tastes so much different. Um, and and sometimes government suppresses the beautiful things like Stalin did, but but sometimes uh, government meddling pushes innovation to do a workaround. Um, that's that's why I'm so excited about crypto, right? Um, I feel like crypto would not be nearly as significant today if someone like Hillary Clinton said that it was the worst thing that's ever happened to America. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to go is. buy some. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. She's the worst well, thing. Well, that's like an un unintended consequence of what they hoped to achieve. Right. Like yeah. Just, it's just like this whole, whole um, kicking Russia out of SWIFT and all of that. That's that's encouraging the cryptocurrency. Right. And other form, getting away from the dollar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's, the, all geopolitical here, but. the um, um, it it is happening with what they're doing to Russia, but but a more interesting example perhaps is what they did to Canadian truckers. And I, yeah. I thought yeah, about I, talking about yeah. this last night, but I'm, I am obsessed with what happened in Canada over the last three or four weeks, and it's still going on right now. But if you're watching this, and if you understand grassroots organization. Um, that was a textbook nonviolent revolution mm -hmm. that defeated a tyrant, right? Um, and you know, Justin Trudeau's got, he's got beautiful hair, right? Like he's, <laughs> he's just beautiful. <laughs> but he's like, he's, he's like a total tyrant mm -hmm. that, that talks out of both sides of his mouth. And he arrested the head. Um, and by the way, the, the head of the trucker protest, she's just a lady. She's not a head of a political party. She's not some sort of operative. She's just a person. She's arrested without bail. And maybe that's changed. I haven't checked in the last couple days. And the truckers were framed as, you remember the narrative, right? They're white nationalists, they're Nazis. They're like, fill in the blank. What's the worst thing you could call somebody? And unfortunately, unfortunately, <laughs> Unfortunately for Justin Trudeau, there's there's these things called iPhones and there was all these live streams of all this. And it turns out that the Nazis love bouncy houses, right? <laughs> they love dance parties. They love saying to the cops that are beating them, I love you. And so the narrative didn't work. And it's in the tradition of, of nonviolent social change that it, I think is profound. So I, I joked about my scathing speech that, that probably changed law in Hawaii, but <laughs> it was these guys that did it, right? Yeah. One of the other products that we have at, at Free the People is another uh, podcast called Leaving the Left for Liberty. And it's a woman that we got to know actually through our Liberty Pub happy hours that we were doing during lockdown. And she was a hardcore progressive and she just couldn't take it anymore and she left the left for liberty and she now has a podcast with us where she interviews other people like her to get different opinions and the one that we just released it gets released every other week was with some of the the, the female truckers um in the in the convoy yeah and so the unintended consequence there was oh, yes. that they actually seized the bank accounts of everyone who was donating money to the, right to the to the truckers and you know on facebook today i saw donate to the ukrainian resistance and i'm thinking I don't think so. You know, they're going right. to, you know, or, or the shoes on the other foot. Now, that would be okay. But if I donate to the truckers, they're going to seize my account. You know, so well, Eric, really Eric, our friend from the big board, he had a um, GoFundMe that got shut down for a while. And then he left to go to give Give, give, send, go. Give, is send, that the go, other one? I think it's, it's, it's a, um, a, a, a Christian conservative, go, you know, GoFundMe type of, of, of thing. But they got hacked, mm -hmm. and and like the one of the one of the other thing that like they were even seizing crypto accounts, and and one of the takeaways in Canada is that one absolutely go crypto if you want some financial independence, but two own your own wallet. Don't 
don't outsource it to a third party. I still haven't done that yet. Yeah, oh. come on, man. <laughs> I need I need help. I don't know how to move it. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up because I bet you we want to drink some more. But <laughs> and you guys don't get to try this unless you come up and pour yourself a glass. But a, a final thought on whiskey. Um, this is a uh, Hibiki Japanese whiskey, and I don't I don't know as much about this. I I know it from drinking it, but I I know a little bit about the history because I was grilling my friend today. Um, uh, and it's it's a story about let me let me come up with a dead economist. Uh, <laughs> I, oh wait. Ray Rutherford. Toshio Murata translated me, my, my Mises into Japanese. So okay. Perfect there oh, you wow. go. Mises. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to come and uh, have cups? So so what you're telling me, Matt, is that our next vacation needs to be to Japan so that we can drink at the source. Oh Which yes, you? definitely. But I like. I'm going with you. <laughs> But I, I like I like localism, and I love national pride, and I love culture that is homegrown, and a lot of the stories about whiskey and other alcohol is about that, right? Like this is ours. Um, the story about Japanese whiskey is a little bit different because uh, Japanese culture was all about sake, and sake, of course, could be turned into a hard alcohol, um, but. In the 1800s, um, they went to the 1900s. I'm screwing up the story. Forget the dates. <laughs> they went to Kentucky and they went to Scotland to learn how they were making whiskey. And the ingredients in this whiskey are, are much likely imported from other places. They're not produced in Japan. So it has everything to do with sort of uh, cultural appropriation and crossing borders and doing things it's that you're really turned on by, by some other culture. Um, and I, I think that's cool too, right? I'm not calling that cultural appropriation. I'm calling that cultural appreciation. Yeah. And well, I think that that's something that we need yes. to focus a little bit yeah, more I, on. I want to say something about that, the difference The difference between Chinese and the Japanese is that the J Japanese will embrace something they don't have. Whatever is from China, from uh, England, from Europe, from United States, they will embrace and improve themselves, get better. But the Chinese, regardless, anybody, anything from outside is uh, inferior. And uh, we just say no to whatever. And um, uh, so that's really divided these two cultures. Are there any Chinese whiskeys? Uh, no, because uh, Chinese will always think that everything they have is better than anybody in the world. So they never allowed anything okay. good and new to come in or they, will, they don't want to go out to what, learn. What so the Japanese is opposite. That's why Japan had been you know, civilized, developed, and the Chinese are not. Now they, they do embrace something for their own purpose. If meet their uh, purpose, government purpose, they will say yes. Otherwise, they will still say no. What do they drink in China? Baijiu, uh, Huangjiu. Ancient communism. Yes. <laughs> Man, by the way, uh, you might want to see uh, uh, the YouTube inter interview that Matt did of uh, Lee, yeah, it's called uh, uh, Chinese, uh, the, the yeah. socialist, socialist, Chinese God. socialist God. Socialist God. God. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the social, <laughs> socialist God. Email. Anyway, really good. Really yeah, we'll send it around in an email. Do question? you have any questions of them? Well, that's really smooth. Yes, uh, uh, Rohanita. Uh, so I love these stories about how you know, whiskey was made. Do you have any stories from Scotland back in the day? Talk, talk about the Highlands thing. I, I think you know the story better than I do. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the like right. The Highlands story you tell. I did. 
Which one? The Chinese drink. Tell it again. I'm not serving this. I'm just showing you. If you want to drink this, you have to come for the next thing. Oh, wow. It's a white one and a yellow one. Yeah. White wine, yellow wine. <laughs> so this is white, this is yellow. So. Please help her drink it, otherwise she'll drink it all herself. <laughs> and I won't be able to see her for a week. No, uh, uh, the funny story about this one uh, is it says it's for, not for ordinary people's consumption. It's for the high rank government official oh, only. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Military. Haves and haves not. <laughs> and uh, somebody had the connection and got one and gave it to me. Wait, Lydia, I gotta take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> I have several bottles because that's the only drinkable one. Should I go to the next question? Sure, sure. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions or comments you'd like to make? Questions? It says here. I always wanted to try it. I, I guess not. Yeah. Okay. The question that's not quite related to whiskey because I remember somewhere 30, 40 years ago, whatever, all of a sudden craft breweries were allowed. Before, all you had was Budweiser, and I'm from Detroit, and we had Stroh Brewery, and you had Pabst Blue Ribbon, but then somewhere <coughs> those restrictions got lifted, and then all of a sudden you had stuff all over. Yeah. It, well, it was Sierra Nevada that was the first craft brewer. Um, and it, what it, happened that the government just lifted some restrictions on local, I mean, I don't know what the story was. You, well, you, you've reminded me of a key part of our story that we didn't tell. Ah, the Murray Rothbard story. Um, mm. No, I was going to talk about prohibition. Um, well, but well, we're, I want to tell a story about Murray Rothbard first. Any Murray fans? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Terry's going to tell the story. So, um, not only been married. And then for, I'm going to answer your question. We've been married for 35 years. Yay. Um, and the first year that we were married, he, well, he was in graduate school at George Mason University, and he got invited out to a conference at Stanford University that was hosted by Hoover. And it was like the first time we'd ever been to California. It was really cool. Um, but more importantly, it was the first time that we had ever had Sierra Nevada. So it was the first time that we're sitting there and we had a beer that tasted like something. <laughs> and, and not only that, but we had it while we were sitting at a picnic table having a conversation with Murray Rothbard. So it was a very, very memorable um, event. Oh, uh, by, by the way, Murray's dead. So cheers. <laughs> He's been dead a long time. Yeah. Did, did you, do you like this one? By the way, the, the do you guys have, who wanted to, do you have the Hibiki? So it's interesting because. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, most, most Scotch whiskey has some element of peat and peat is the moss that they dig out of the ground to roast the malted barley. Um, the Japanese don't do that. So you, you get a different thing. And it's a beautiful thing. Hibiki means noise. But it really, um, I mean, the whole craft brewing happened. It was a state by state um, rolling back of regulations that would allow different um, breweries to, to um, start. And it, but it does go back to prohibition because before prohibition, there were everybody made beer or, you know, whatever. Everybody a had local a stone. brewery. The local everywhere. brewery was everywhere. But I mean, Yeah. Yeah. So like <laughs> the repeal of prohibition was very much a form of crony capitalism because prohibition had exempted certain distilleries for medicinal purposes. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Religious yeah. purposes or, or medicinal. The repeal of prohibition very much created a cartel of breweries in this in the, in the, in this instance of your question. Um, so, so everything that I hate about mass-produced beer, I call it pee, no offense to you guys that like that kind of beer. Um, it's because the government created a cartel and it wasn't until I think 79 that Jimmy Carter legalized. Yeah. Um, he legalized 
home brewing. And there was another series of regulations that allowed for local breweries to sell directly to customers. So on the West Coast, like Washington, Oregon, California, uh, the Sierra Nevada that Terry was talking about, um, that was this radical revolution where, where people that love beer, they love the craft of beer, they love the art of beer. They were now legally allowed to make beer for their neighbors. Well, what made Jimmy Carter do that? Who knows? <laughs> well, he was drinking the beer that his brother was I making. Remember he deregulated <laughs> <laughs> he deregulated everything. Remember CAA's Billy's beer? Civil Award, the yeah. FCC. He deregulated a lot Jimmy of Carter beer. was an Jimmy incredibly like there was a lot of deregulation that happened under Jimmy Carter. The question. Thanks. You know, I'm, I'm an academia, so I normally can't speak up with anything that's less than far. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I get red faced, livid people yelling at me. So how do you handle, like, with COVID? You know, anyone who goes against the narrative is like, people are dying. Like, yeah. they just, how do you handle that? I mean, how can you stay cool? Have you ever convinced anyone? Yes. Is red faced. And yeah. Blinded? So, um, he's a pretty calm guy, right? <laughs> pretty chill, pretty laid back. And, and we, he, he's more the public, um, facing, uh, person of the organization, but we always go out of our way to not be that that flamethrower. Um, so he's been on Bill Maher and he was on Chris Matthews. And I mean, he has been the target of some really, really hostile interviews. And actually the Bill Maher story is funny because I would always travel out with him and I would sit in the audience. And like, that was actually more stressful for me than him being up there because I would be surrounded by these people like, who is that asshole? And, and like at one point it was so bad, it almost became a Jerry Springer moment because I was going to go after this girl. <laughs> She's but, like, he's an asshole, but he's my asshole. Right. I'm the only one. I'm the only one that gets to call him that. <laughs> but, but, what is, but, but, but what we found after he would do these, um, you know, we we're in California, so we'd go out to dinner. And people would come up to him and be like, I saw you on Bill Maher last night. And we're like, oh, shit. And, but what they would say was, I didn't agree with anything that you said, but I liked how you presented your viewpoint and you gave me something to think about. And so that's why we tell stories. We don't hit people over the head with the ideology. We tell stories. Um, AOC, sorry, I'll get to you. She famously said, it's better to be morally right than to be factually correct, right? So think about that. But that's why the left wins, because they talk about the morals. They talk about the- Morals, they're the most immoral group in the whole thing. Right, but they talk about the little girl that couldn't get an operation. They appeal to your emotions. They appeal to your emotions. So I like to say that we as libertarians, we are both morally right and factually correct, but we have to stop focusing on the facts and, and focus on the morals and the story. And that's how we will win. That's right. That's right. Thank that's you. Right. Other questions? Okay. Yeah. Oh, and there's a question uh, over there too. Mark. Yeah. Um, oh, yummy. Was, uh, which oh yo, Mark. No, uh, oh, we got several oh, marks. Andy, Andy. Uh, my favorite part about whiskey or bourbon or any of this is the racing history involved. Like, oh. No, we did not. But we actually learned the, that story about NASCAR from Joe Jorgensen, who ran for the LP. She's a big bourbon drinker herself. And she told us the story. We might have been drinking bourbon at the time that NASCAR came out of prohibition, that the NASCAR drivers were the drivers that were running the bootleg and they modified their cars and they learned how to drive fast to escape from the, the, the law. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, that's actually a hundred percent true story. Right, All the other right. stories are only 80% yeah. true. The, the very first official NASCAR winner was a bootleg driver. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a great story. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's all those for rentals.
Great. Yeah, Smokey and the Bandit. Uh, Mark, has, Mark one, has a question. Okay, one last question, then we will uh, go to dessert and then uh, talk to them and ask questions and whatever you want or go home and uh, <laughs> okay. yeah. All right, so, last Mark, question. So, you guys said something, and I loved everything you said. Thank there you. There's one thing, that one part of what you said, that left me wondering about whether I'm in agreement or disagreement with you, or even what your position is. Your friend, um, Eric, uh -huh. who had the store. The, who, the bar. Who had the bar. Right. And the rule was he had to check vaccine <laughs> cards. And um, you mentioned something about he didn't want to discriminate. Right. I'm not sure I understand what your position is here. Because the issue isn't whether, to me, the issue isn't whether vaccine cards need to be checked or not. The issue is who's making that decision. The right. only thing, I'm not pro or anti vac right. I don't, I mean, I have personal opinion on right. it. But what's important is who's making the decision here. And right. the same thing about discrimination. You presented it as if discrimination was a bad thing. And maybe it is. But, but he gets to discriminate whether he, we're in favor of discrimination here. The problem isn't that he's discriminating and we shouldn't discriminate or the problem is he should discriminate he's the one who gets to discriminate and i think that's our point and if we don't make the right point we're not communicating the right message and that's why we're losing i agree we need to talk more about morality we need to talk about what our point is and if we miss the point at all we're wasting our time right it's like saying i don't care if marijuana is harmful or not I don't care if it if it helps a medical condition or not. That has nothing to do with our argument. Mm -hmm. Our argument is who gets to make the decision about that question. So, right. what do you? What are your personal positions? But our this? but our our story is like on my our. I'll, she'll correct me because she does. <laughs> I understand. Our, I feel your pain. Only, but, when, you're, uh, only when you're wrong. <laughs> you know, only life. when I'm wrong, which happens every day. <laughs> um, I, I think individuals decide these things. Right. Okay. Um, but I also happen to think that Eric's right. Mm -hmm. I agree with his personal position. What is his position? I'm not going to discriminate. Oh, because they were forcing it. On they were, yeah. The, the government was forcing him to check people's papers, and he, and he said no. And he, and he made the personal yeah, decision, well, and he rejected right. that. But, um, and I'm going to ask Terry to tell the story. But Eric is a bartender, and bartenders don't care about your politics, <laughs> and they don't care where you were born and they don't care about the color of your skin, they care about whether or not you're a beautiful person that wants to come drink a beer. The ones we like anyway. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so Eric tells the story about how this, and it's actually Dick Rowland's line. He says, you know, this is not a Republican issue. This isn't a Democrat issue. It's not left or right. It's an American issue. And he says, you know, sometimes I like Republicans. Sometimes I like Democrats. Sometimes I don't like Republicans. Right. Sometimes I don't like Democrats. And I said, you just described us. Right. Like, we're libertarians. And he's like, oh, no, no, I'm not a libertarian. Yeah. And then um, later on, we had a conversation. And, and he's like, all right, I am a libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? Er no, Eric. Oh, Eric, Eric Flannery. But he, but he tells a story like, so his bar is, is walking distance from the U.S. Capitol. Okay. And it's, it's in... A, um, a a new up and coming neighborhood. Up and coming neighborhood, and he has a story that he tells that he loves. Like he, he, he lights up when he tells a story about his two best nights. Yeah. In business. Right. So he's. It's a small bar. Um, it's it's a great space. Um, a good night for Eric is a good day is seven thousand dollars. Right. I mean, it's we're not talking huge. And he told us the story, and we didn't get it on film, so we have to again. The two best nights that he had in his bar was January 20th, the day that Trump got inaugurated. He made $11,000 that day. And then the next day was the Woman's March on Washington. And it, I think it actually was bigger or the same. He made $11,000 that day from all of the women wearing the stupid pussy hats. So his two best days were the first day filled with Trumpers and Republicans, and the next day was filled with people that were coming to the city to protest Trump being elected. <laughs> and, and so that's what makes his bar so beautiful. And I mean, we've talked to him and people walk down the street and he's like, oh yeah, that's Bob and Mary. They, they had their first date here. They got engaged. Now they have kids. Like he is truly, cheers. He is the, the neighborhood bar and he just wants to be left alone and 
if he doesn't want to check people's vax papers, that's great. People won't go there that are afraid, but people like us that like freedom, we'll go there and, and celebrate him. So I want to thank you all um, for listening to us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for great time. Is made with uh, bourbon. Yeah. 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 Yeah.